Rolling. Well, welcome back to the Steve Max Muscle, Char Muscle Car Show podcast, uh, brought to you by High Octane Classics, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership, located at 143 Washington Street in Auburn, Massachusetts. Uh, High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. You can call them at 508 859 4515. Of course, this is episode or show number 46 of the Steve Mag's Muscle Car Show podcast, and uh, as you all know, what I'm doing in this show is reading from my book that I published back in 2013, Steve Yonti's 1001 Muscle Car Facts, and uh, what I gen generally tend to do is read oh, 10 to 15, maybe 20 of these facts, depending on time, roughly a half an hour's worth. And uh, between each fact, what I'll, I'll include is a little bit of commentary, as they call it, author commentary, to describe why I chose that fact, or maybe some more information that came to light after the fact was written. So uh, here we are now, each of these uh, chapters in the book, we're in Plymouth right now, and each chapter is broken into subsections, which go legend and lore, which we've done, body and interior, which we've done, engine and driveline, which we've done in previous shows, and now we're into the suspension and brakes subchapter of the Plymouth world. And as we get about halfway into the show, we'll break out of suspension and brakes and get into number crunching and press commentary, which is, to me, one of the more fun angles of each chapter of each manufacturer of vehicles. Now, as we move out of Plymouth today, we'll go into Dodge. Actually, that's next episode. But anyway, uh, Dodge comes up after Plymouth, after all they are Chrysler products. Okay, let's begin with uh, fact number 672. This is the beautiful Plymouth Roadrunner. Here we go. The 1968 through 70 Roadrunner uses specific front suspension lower control arms. They're only shared with the GTX and Belvedere's and satellites equipped with the heavy duty front suspension option, which cost a mere $23.25. Unique features not found on lesser control arms are welded tabs to accept front sway bar and links. Uh, I learned this during the restoration of a 1968 Hemi Roadrunner coupe. Somebody snatched the original lower control arms and there was no place to connect the front sway bar. Eventually, the correct replacements were scavenged from a Slant 6 Belvedere resting in a New Hampshire junkyard. Yes, even Slant 6 cars could be ordered with the heavy-duty suspension. Yeah, that was uh, an interesting eye-opener. You know, back in, I think, 1988 or so, my grandma passed and left me $10,000 to, uh, uh, my father said, pay off my student loans. Well, I had different ideas. So what I did instead was uh, I uh, continued on the student loans but bought a Hemi car. And back in the day, I said, you know, I got 10 grand. What can I buy with that? And at that point in time, the mid 80s, you know, Roadrunners with 383s, Challengers with 340s, that stuff, those are like five, six, seven thousand dollar cars in the mid 80s. Nice ones. Uh, but Hemi cars were just in the 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 20 thousand dollar range. So I found this 68 Hemi Roadrunner four speed coupe. A fellow in Belchertown, Mass, had the thing. The engine was out, but uh, he said, hey, tell you what, 10 grand when it's done, you help me put it together. And uh, so that's how it was. But again, as we went, the car was a, it was a 318 in it, uh, we pieced it back together. But again, somewhere along the line, somebody snagged the front control arm, so no front sway bar. And of course, all Hemi cars have heavy duty suspension with a front sway bar. So we found the parts in that New Hampshire junkyard. The car was finished. Uh, I ended up not buying it in the long run because I found a better car, 68 Hemi Charger, which was an automatic, which I wasn't too thrilled with, but it was more complete and it ran, it was ready to rock. So I bought that one instead. And of course, I've referenced that car here, there, and everywhere in my various uh, ramblings over the years. But that's the story of lower control control arms on Roadrunners. They're uh, specific. Okay, continuing with Roadrunner activity was fact 673. The first Roadrunner equipped with a rear sway bar appeared in 1971. The bar was located above the rear axle housing and reduced understeer. Most aftermarket Roadrunner rear sway bar kits are designed to fit below the axle, General Motors style, where they can be tangled with road debris. By contrast, original equipment bars tucked up over the axle. Yeah, that's that's a fact. You know, a lot of folks today will buy, uh, you know, PST or uh, you know any number of companies that make a, a rear sway bar. And what a rear anti-roll bar does basically is it uh, it adds a stiffness by 
connecting the right and left leaf springs with a bar that kind of makes it less for the body to roll. Uh, the bar resists that. To me, I don't know, I don't know hemi cars and, and muscle cars to me are about going in a straight line. So stuff that uh, messes with the rear suspension and keeps it from just lifting and going forward, I'm, I'm not a big fan of. So when I see like a hemi charger or, or you know, any, any kind of a Mopar with an add-on bar underneath the axle, I always kind of say, oh man, that guy doesn't get it. That's just me. That's just me. Uh, but in the world of GM cars, of course, when you see the bar down below, that means F41 heavy duty suspension. But in the world of Mopars, yes, yeah, 71, even Challengers, the, the anti-roll bar at the back of the car was generally not visible uh, at the rear silhouette. So that's the story on that. Okay, let's go with some brake information with fact 674. The first mass production use of aluminum disc brake rotors was the 1997 through 2002 Prowler. None of them were made in 1998, which was a skip year. Used only on the rear of the car, each rotor was specially cast with an integrated iron friction liner because the soft parent aluminum quickly galled from pad contact. Up front, the Prowler's conventional cast iron disc brakes were taken straight from the LH sedan parts bin. Yeah, the Prowler was an interesting little creature, you know, 97 through 2002, and again, none in 1998, uh, just as there were no 1983 uh, Corvettes. There's no such thing as an 83 Corvette. Same thing with the Prowler. Different story all the way around. But yeah, it's true. If you look at the rear discs on a Prowler, you'll see a shiny area right in the middle where the friction uh, pads make contact, and the rest of it's an aluminum casting, uh, and that was to save weight. And keep in mind, the Prowler was one of the most aluminum-intensive production cars ever. Something like 700 pounds of every Prowler was made of aluminum. Pretty advanced stuff for its time, including the engine block on the V6 engine located uh, up under the nose of the Prowler. Okay, let's continue with more uh, Mopar goodies. This here is some stuff on um, springs. Okay, fact 675. One notable deviation from the 1976 through 80 F bodies transverse torsion bar front suspension was that coil over springs were employed beneath the nose of the 1977 through 80 Monteverdi Sierra. A limited production car based on Volari four door sedan and wagons, about 20 Monteverdi Sierras were built by Monteverdi Binningen Motors in Basel, Switzerland. Better known for his 426 Hemi-powered mid-engine Monteverdi High 450 SS sports car of 1970 and the 440 wedge-powered 375 high-speed touring sedans and coupes of 1967 through 69, Monteverdi reskinned the Volare body with sleek sheet metal, though hints of the stock Volare roofline, window glass, and interior remained. Unfortunately, by the mid-1970s, engine swaps were forbidden by the EPA, so Sierras were powered by export versions, with no catalytic converters, of the 318 and 360 small blocks rather than the Hemis and 446 barrels of our dreams. Peter Monteverdi passed away on July 4, 1998, but his many creations are on display at the Monteverdi Car Collection, Switzerland's, Switzerland's largest car museum. Yeah, in the last episode, I believe we talked about the Monteverdi High, or recently I have anyway, but that was a uh, mid-engined, hemi-powered exotic. Pretty crazy stuff. But again, uh, if you Google uh, Monteverdi Sierra, S-I-E-R-R-A, you'll see pictures Looks like a Velari or an Aspen, but with some very exotic uh, sheet metal grafted on. So yeah, Peter Monteverdi. But here's the deal. Again, like I say, you got to remember that the uh, 76 through 80 F body Velari and Aspen used a novel front torsion bar uh, instead of the longitudinally positioned bars on A bodies, B bodies, E bodies, C bodies in Chrysler land. These F cars actually used torsion bars that were sort of shaped like a hockey stick, and they ran transverse under the radiator, side to side. Kind of weird. But Peter Monteverdi, well, for whatever reasons, decided not to utilize that so he went with a redesign which included coil over front spring so again the only quote F body unquote uh, semi production car not to use those transverse leaf springs were the Monteverdi Sierras of uh, the uh, late 70s okay Google it it's a pretty cool story the Monteverdi Sierra check that out they're they're pretty neat okay moving on fact 676 excluding cars ordered with optional front disc brakes the only 426 Street Hemi Plymouth's not equipped with 11 by 3 front drum brakes with the one year only 1967 RO23 B stock Belvedere 2 hardtops. 
to reduce unsprung mass for quicker starting line sprints, the 55 RO23 Belvedere's plus another 55 similar Dodge WO23 Coronets were fitted with 10 by 2.5 inch front drums. The rear brakes were the usual street hemi spec 11 by 2.5 heavy duty drums. It was a brave choice because the disc brake equipped 67 hemi cars came with 10 inch rear drums to maintain proper front to rear brake balance and were already in the parts bin. Clearly, the RO and WO planners intentionally selected the beefy 11 by 2.5 inch rear drums to put an extra 6 pounds of mass over each slick for better traction, despite the slight mis mismatch in braking force resulting from the combination of the 10 inch and 11 inch front and rear drums. Perhaps to cover their tracks from product liability standpoints, RO and WO23 builds, build sheets are coated for front disc brakes, which are about 10 pounds heavier than the 10 inch drums used in actual production. Yeah, that's a weird one. You know, 1967, of course, we know that roughly 110 of these uh, Dodge and Plymouth RO Superstock hardtops were built for use in, I think, what B-Stock uh, drag racing. And again, if you look at the build sheet on one of those things, they'll be coated for front disc brakes. Uh, which were also new for 1967 on all B-body Mopars, uh, but they came with a 10-inch drum. You know, it's true, if you ever take a peek at a Chrysler 10-inch and 11-inch uh, drum brake, like on a Charger RT, you'll see that the 11-inch drums are a forging. They're big, they're heavy, whereas the 10-inch drums are lighter. They're actually multi-piece stamped steel. So, you know, Chrysler was thinking about mass and sprung and unsprung weight when they built those RO and wo 23 cars but it is kind of weird most cars you know almost always the front brakes are larger than the rear brakes because the front tires do about 70 percent of the braking uh in most every application so to have a 10 inch drum up front and an 11 inch drum in the back is very unconventional but it was done but only on those ro and bo or wo 23 super stocks moving on let's go to more ro 23 goodies and wheel data with fact 677 only three Plymouth high-performance package cars were delivered to retail customers with bare steel wheels and exposed lug nuts, with the wheel covers intentionally omitted. One was the 1967 RO23 Hemi, of which 55 were built, which rolled on 15 by 6 JK hoops painted white to match the mandatory white body color. Then, in 1969 and a half, the A12 446 barrel Roadrunner was delivered with black 15 by 6 inch rims, of which 1,412 of those were built, but those had chromed lug nuts to add eye appeal. Finally, in the depths of the smogged out 1970s, the Volari A67 Super Coupe arrived in 1978 wearing huge argent silver painted 15 by 8 steel wheels shod with GR60 by 15 Goodyear GT radials. Along with 531 Dodge Aspen Super Coupes, the 494 Volari Super Coupes sourced their huge wheels mostly C Fact 678 coming up in a second from the 4x4 Plymouth Trail Duster and Dodge Ram Charger parts bin. Again, chrome lug nuts added eye appeal. Yeah, it's an interesting fact. In fact, I think Motor Trend, right around 1977 or 8, had a cover car which was a sort of, um, or burgundy and silver, if I remember correctly. Um, Dodge Aspen Super Coupe. Beautiful car, but again, big, fat, 15 by 8 inch rims on those things. And again, no uh, no hubcaps at all. Very, very beefy looking critter. But again, if you know your Plymouth Trail Dusters and Dodge Ram Chargers, you'll be fully aware, hey, those rims are from the, the uh, Ram Charger parts bin. Or are they? Here's the thing. As we learn in fact 678, there were different wheels. Okay, 678, fact. Two distinct styles of Super Coupe and kit car wheels were used in 1978, differentiated by their center spider. The most common was a plain stamping with four legs joining to the hoop. A more appealing variant used six ovoid cooling slots pressed into the spider in a loose interpretation of the popular five-slot Chevy rally wheel. As with most Chrysler passenger car wheels, Kelsey Hayes was the source and both shared the same 15 by 8 inch hoop and 4.5 inch backspacing dimension. Unlike the four leg spider stamping, the six slot type was never used on trail duster or ram charger SUV applications and is a rare commodity today. 
Yeah, if you look at that Motor Trend cover, I'm pretty sure that one came with the six slot police type wheels. And speaking of the police type wheels, uh, starting I think in 1977 or so, uh, Chrysler Plymouth police cars and Dodge came with a 15 by 7 inch wheel, uh, often called the cop wheel. And they're similar to a Chevy rally wheel, except they have six slots instead of five. Uh, but keep, keep in mind though, those are 15 by 7 inches wide. Uh, the 15 by 8 inch wide type used on the uh, Super Coupes came strictly from uh, th their own application. But again, there was also a standard steel wheel looking creature without any slots. And that was found uh, again on uh, a majority of the Super Coupes used in, or built in 1978. Okay, more goodies here with break stuff. Uh, fact number 679. Um, okay, 1962 through 64, Plymouth and Dodge Max wedges were built with four-corner 10-inch drum brakes. The big 11-inch drum brake package didn't arrive until the 1966 model year, standard on street hemis. Still, the 10 by 2.5 inch, inch front drums were perfectly capable of safely stopping the Max wedge in every day, in other words, sane, driving conditions. By contrast, the 9 inch brake drums fitted to certain competing muscle cars were marginal when driven hard. Of course, I'm talking to you, General Motors, which put, uh, they're actually 9.5 inch drums on GTOs, 442s, Grand Sports, uh, and yeah, SS 396s came with 9.5 inch drum brakes all the way around. Now, there's a little bit of a, an addition or a change or an update I got to make here. I reference here that 62 through 64 uh, Plymouth and Dodge B bodies did not come with 11 inch drum brakes. Well, it's true with the Max wedges, they had 10s, but there was actually a police package which could be had with 11 by 3 inch front drums and 11 by 2 inch rear drums. In fact, I'm about to buy one out of uh, the great Mopar Horde uh, auction event in Texas, 62 Dodge uh, 330 with 11 inch police brakes on it right from the factory. But when it comes down to Max Wedge cars, I personally have never seen a Max Wedge car with the cross ram and the factory cutouts built with 11 inch drums. Uh, it may have happened, but I, I don't think it was part of the package. And by the way, I want to take a moment here to thank our sponsors, High Octane Classics, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership located at 143 Washington Street in Auburn, Massachusetts. Uh, High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. You can call them at 508-859-4515. And uh, yeah, our buddies at High Octane are great folks. Uh, they always have an interesting inventory of um, Ford, Chevy, Mopar, and yeah, Ferrari, if you like that, Porsche, all kinds of cool stuff. Give them a call. Again, 508-859-4515. Okay, let's get back to the show and move back to 1954 uh, with fact number 680. In 1954, the hottest Plymouth packed a 110 horsepower flathead six. Law enforcement agencies dismissed Plymouth offerings for all but the most mundane college campus security details. But by 1956, Plymouth had blossomed into a worthy competitor to the Ford Police Interceptor dynasty. In addition to V8 engines, which arrived in 1955, a key selling point shared with every Plymouth model were center plane front drum brakes. Equipped with two wheel cylinders per drum, that is two wheel cylinders per drum, the scheme promised for more even brake shoe application against the drum versus the dual acting single cylinder used in competing brake designs. Interestingly, Plymouth rear drum brakes continued to use the single Lockheed style wheel cylinders. Though superior on the drafting table, Chrysler's center plane drum brake strategy failed to demonstrate a clear advantage over traditional single cylinder brake drum designs and, re and was replaced on full size vehicles by less costly Bendix single cylinder drum brakes after the 1962 model year. The 1962 up mid-size B body and 60 up compact A body never employed center plane drum brakes. Yeah, I learned this myself when I bought a 54 Plymouth uh, Belvedere, I believe it was. It was a four-door uh, formerly owned by nuns in Springfield, Massachusetts. Had the flathead, three-speed manual, and indeed up front when I pulled the drums off, I was baffled to see uh, not the usual single wheel cylinder at the 12 o'clock position up at noon, but rather at noon and at 6 o'clock, there was two wheel cylinders, one top, one bottom. And instead of having pistons on both sides, right and left, uh, the top one had one on the front, the bottom one had one on the back, and these things actually pressed the shoe out in uh, a single direction against the brake drum. 
the problem with those things was adjusting them took a very strange uh, process. There was a, a nut on the back with a cam and an eccentric, and you had to get just the right amount of brake drag. It was kind of a pain in the butt, to be honest with you. And again, they were gone after 1962. But yeah, center plane front brakes were actually an advertising selling point in, in Plymouth uh, back in the 1950s, but again, uh, never really used on uh, police cars in, in Plymouth land until 56, when the V8 cars finally broke into the police market. Okay, speaking of breaking into, we're going to break into to the number crunching and press commentary part of the uh, the Plymouth chapter from my book, leaving suspension and brakes and entering number crunching and press commentary right now with fact 681. The low price 1968 Roadrunner rewrote the muscle car marketing game by appealing directly to teenage buyers. In his 2007 memoir. Pontiac Pizzazz. Jim, father of the GTO Wangers, offers this glowing praise. Quote, Much to our surprise, we began to lose market share during the 1968 model year. A new competitor had appeared from out of nowhere and was eating into our sales leadership. That new competitor was the Plymouth Roadrunner. Not only had the Chrysler guys created a new car, the marketing job on it had been a stroke of genius. It was so good, I wish I had thought of it. End quote. Indeed, while the Plymouth GTX was an unabashed imitation of the original GTO image car recipe, the Roadrunner blazed its own path to success and forced competitors to whip up budget supercars of their own. Yeah, it's true that uh, the Roadrunner with its little beep beep horn and Warner Brothers tie-in was um, conjured by Plymouth executives who were watching their kids watch Saturday morning cartoons. And these kids that they had were like 9, 10, 11 years old. And this guy thought, I think his name was Cherry, Wayne Cherry, I believe was his name. Uh, but he came up, he says, you know what, these kids within a year or two are going to start to buy cars. And why don't we, you know, grab them while they're young and influence them. And let's get this Roadrunner thing so that when people who are like 17, 18, 19, ready to buy a car, we see the Roadrunner zipping around on TV and say, you know what, this car is like that. I'll take one. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. But even Jim Wangers, the father of the GTO, uh, was somewhat jealous, I guess, of, uh, of the Plymouth Roadrunner, and of course, in 1969, when the judge came along with this little rap, here come the judge, that old routine, and its little sticker, its little you know cartoon sticker of its own, the judge, uh, that was something of a nod of respect to the Roadrunner. And early on, as we all know, the judge was supposed to be a decontented GTO with more go and less show. But as it turned out in the end, it was basically a, a GTO with a cherry on top, you know, extra graphics, the wing, the Ram Air, that kind of stuff. But with that said, the Judge is an amazing car. I love them and respect them. But yeah, the, the Roadrunner really launched a thousand ships, including the Judge. Okay, let's move on to uh, aerodynamics and funny cars with fact 682. This is a quote. On the first four runs, the driver, Tom Mongoose McEwen, was sorting things out and held speeds in the 140 mile per hour bracket. Everything seemed to be safe in this speed range, so he decided to take it a little higher. Tom remembers everything about that famous fifth run. Just as the car entered the lights, the hood began to bulge in the middle and start to flutter violently. Eyewitness reports and photos show that the car arched over backwards until it was perpendicular to the ground, at which point several feet of daylight was seen between the bumper and the ground while the car was flipping, bouncing, and generally destroying itself. Tom remembers having one recurring thought, quote, I sure hope they've let us build another one, end quote. Such was the magazine coverage printed in the December 1965 issue of Car Life pertaining to the on-track destruction of Tom McEwen's Hemi Cuda 1 match racer at Lions Drag Strip. And yes, Chrysler let him build another one, the nearly identical Hemi Cuda 2. Yeah, it's funny. We often think of Barracudas and Hemis, and of course the Hemi under glass comes to mind, the wheel stander. But that thing, like the Little Red Wagon, a 100 pickup truck, was originally built for straight line acceleration with all four tires on the ground. But in the case of the Little Red Wagon in particular, they noticed very quickly that the nose was very light with the engine set so far back, and it started doing wheelies. So, you know what? Let's just make this thing a wheel stander. Similar thing with the Hearst Hemi under glass. Initially, it was also supposed to be a quarter miler, but uh, when it began to pull wheelies, it too was turned into a wheel stander. But not so much with uh, McEwen's Hemi Cuda 1, 1965. In fact, if uh, you look up mid-1965 Rod in Custom Magazine, uh, there is a cover shot of that car on it, as well as 
many other magazines. It was a big deal. But McEwen's car was very different. It had a supercharged 426 Hemi located behind the driver, sitting under the window. And again, supercharged, okay? So it wasn't injected or carbureted like the others. And indeed, that was meant to go straight and stay on the ground, but aerodynamics intervened, and yes, that thing went airborne. So the second one, and indeed, uh, they did let him build another one, as, as he said, uh, that thing ran better, and I believe that ran well into the eights at like 160 miles per hour. And a funny thing is, too, my book, uh, Steve Mignotti's 1001 Muscle Car Facts, uh, the first issue that came out in 2013 contained an error. Uh, I claimed that the problem happened at Pomona. The reality is it happened at Lions Drag Strip. They're both in California, but the uh, second edition of the book will say Lions for fact number 682. So check yours on page 273. If yours says Pomona, it is an early edition. If it says Lions, it's the more common and correct edition. Okay, fact 683 with more CUDA information. Here we go. The new for 1969 CUDA 340 was almost marketed as the Barracuda Mopar 340. Proof appears on page 48 of the October 1968 issue of Motor Trend magazine in the form of a sleek red fastback test car wearing matte black Mopar 340 front fender decals. Road tester Eric Dahlquist explains, quote, Mopar as a name wasn't quite right, understand? It didn't fit. People the drags had been calling Plymouth's Mopars for 10 years, so it's old, okay? End quote. Further reading reveals Dahlquist actually preferred the Mopar moniker, more in touch with the street race crowd, but understood Plymouth's last-minute change to CUDA. Ironically, Dodge has recently revisited. Sorry, start again. <laughs> Ironically, Dodge has recently revisited the concept, applying the Mopar brand to the limited edition Mopar 2010 Challenger. Mopar 2011 Charger, Mopar 2012 300, and Mopar 2013 Dart, of which 500 units each were built and fitted with a full complement of interior, exterior, and performance touches. Yeah, that's true. You know, today, yeah, it's a Mopar. We all think that that means Chrysler product. Well, apparently, you know, the internal uh, people at, uh, at Plymouth thought that Mopar 340 on the Barracuda uh, Junior Muscle Car was an obscure reference, and in fact, you know, Mopar stands for Motor Parts, which was the parts subsidiary of Chrysler Corporation's uh, brand in the 1930s. So I guess they figured, you know, Mopar, yeah, it reminds me of my old man's 35 Plymouth and, and the flathead engine and all that stuff. So they were kind of ahead of and behind the curve at the same time. But it is funny, though, that, uh, you know, in 11 years ago, the Mopar 2010 Challenger began a uh, self-aware reference to the Mopar brand seen right on those cars. And those cars, if you ever see them, they're generally, I think they're, they're matte black with light blue Mopar uh, stripes and graphics on them. And inside, again, they have nifty, or nifty little features from the Mopar performance catalog. But again, those are completely factory-made cars. And with only 500 of each made, they're pretty collectible. And it's hard to imagine, as I read this in 2021, it's been 11 years since the 2010 Mopar Challenger arrived on the scene, but uh, time passes. It's also amazing, too, to remember that the Challenger, the, uh, the LC Challenger that we know and love, launched in 2008. Has it really been 13 years? since uh, the Challenger arrived on the scene? And the answer is, yeah. And there's no end in sight, which I love. And, and the beauty is, you know, the Fox Mustang built between 79 and 93, I think it was. Uh, I think the Challenger LC is about to surpass, surpass that in, um, in uh, years on the market. I don't think we've quite hit the production numbers. Those Mustangs, the Foxes, I mean, millions of those things were built. By contrast, I would say probably, oh, six to 700,000 Challengers have been made since 2008, which is a bunch. That's a great thing. Okay, we're going to wrap up uh, show number 46 with fact 684. Here it goes. Several years before decal supercars clouded Detroit skies in the mid-1970s, Plymouth's 1970 product planning team charted a different course. In a review of the division's 1970 muscle offerings, Motor Trend magazine wrote, quote, Plymouth has finally made a complete breakthrough of the performance barrier with the Cuda and Duster. Their performance cars have so much muscle, they don't need a lot of extra razzle-dazzle to catch your eye. They've got your ear, end quote. Indeed, the Hemi Cuda's hockey stick side stripe was an option, and a very popular one. 
Yeah, it's true. You know, the supercars of the 60s, a lot of those cars did rely on stickers and, and lots of eye-catching pizzazz. Um, but you get into the, uh, the Cuda, uh, 340, the Hemi Cuda, etc., and even the Duster 340, there's fairly minimal uh, stickers on them. Of course, this writer would eat his words. 1971, the Hemi Cuda had that big billboard on the side, and of course, he get into the later 70s, and uh, like the 75 Roadrunner had that weird uh, vanishing highway kind of sticker on the deck lid, that massive square thing. So again, stickers and supercars really always have gone hand in hand, and that's a good thing. Okay, well, that wraps up episode 46. We certainly want to thank our sponsors at High Octane Classics, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership, located at 143 Washington Street in Auburn, Massachusetts. High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. Give them a call at 508-859-4515. And we'll be back with episode number 47 soon. And be sure to uh, log into the Steve Mignanti YouTube channel, which you're probably watching right now, and subscribe and tell your friends. We'll see you next time.